folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. If you remember last week, we talked about these other Christs, plural, many of them, and we're talking about a few of them today, that there was a correlation between Quetzalcoatl and the rising of the sun, um, not only from morning to evening, the sun going up, sun going down, next day doing it all over again, but rising from the south tropic, rising up past the equator to the north tropic, and then going back down again. So he's rising up to the north, that's his ascension, coming back down from the north to the south is him descending or condescending uh, to our state or past the equator, our state, and down to the grave. And then he rises again. So keep that in mind as we study today's other Christ. Let's start in Matthew chapter 24, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, not possible, it is not possible. They shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm looking at that word secret, <clears throat> and that, that catches my attention. I don't know why I never thought of it before. The Bible tells, especially in the New Testament, over and over about Christ being revealed from heaven, being revealed. Then shall he, then shall the sign of the Son of Man appear. He's going to make an appearance. Every eye shall see him. So when they say he is in the secret chambers, that's a clue. Don't believe that. He's not secret anything anymore. In the Old Testament, you can find Jesus just about on every page because he's there. He's a rock. He's a lamb. He's a high priest. He's a prophet. He is water. He is everything in the Old Testament. But he's not given the name Jesus. He's not given the name. He's foretold that he will be Emmanuel, but he... Nobody in the Old Testament calls anybody by that name. And so in the New Testament now, he's revealed. He's plainly revealed. We have four gospel writers, four eyewitness accounts who saw what they saw, and they wrote down everything that they saw with impeccable clarity and continuity, which means that Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree as to almost even the very words that he spoke. John, of course, was taking a different narrative, but he's plainly revealed, if not in the Gospels, which he is, then in the epistles, the, the letters, the teachings, the doctrine that we believe. He is plainly revealed, and there's nothing now kept secret about Jesus Christ. He is going to be revealed in these last days. He is not in a secret chamber hidden somewhere. Hang on to that one, okay? And then 2 Corinthians 11, we're warned about another Jesus whom we have not preached, another spirit whom, which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted. We're warned about that. Then, remember John writes five books of the Bible all in the New Testament, John, the three letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then Revelation. He's the only one to ever mention or use the word Antichrist. That's where we get it from. And if you notice there, not one of them is capitalized. Not giving him his due today, guarantee you that. Little children, it is the last time, and as you've heard that Antichrist shall come even there, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar? 22 is the number for revelation. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist. 
that denieth the Father and the Son. And I promise you, there's going to be something, some doctrine pop up. It's not going to be new because there is no new doctrine under the sun. It's going to be rehashing of an old doctrine, probably the Gnostic idea that God did not father Jesus, that Jesus is not God, that God created an emanation who also created an emanation, who created a lower emanation, who created a further emanation, who created a uh, less likely emanation, who created a scumbag you know, emanation, who then created Jesus Christ. So then Jesus Christ ain't really the Father's Son. It's not really that way. That's close to what they're going to say. 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where if you've heard that it should come, and even now, already is it in the world, and it has been in the world. 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. So are a lot of people in Hollywood, in Nashville, in Motown, and Washington, D.C. Yeah, a lot of people. So, we've been talking about historic antichrist and how it seems the devil has set up. Remember in Genesis 3, he is the serpent who is more subtle than any beast of the field. And is it just an accident that the word subtle has a letter that you'd never know was there? I'm talking about the letter B. Because unless, you know, you're born in certain parts of America, you never say subtle. But I know some people that do. It's subtle. The bee's there that you never know it, do you? You never hear it. Don't think about it. But it's there. That's the definition of the word subtle. All right? So, we've been talking about the setup of these subtle Christs. Different areas of the world all have somewhat of a different story. We started out with Tamas from the Bible, launched out from there. We've dealt with Quetzalcoatl, the fiery flying serpent, God, and we know those are real. So did the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Incas, did they just make up this God? Did, did some guy go, what could be a God? Ooh, a snake, I hate snake. That could be a God. Yeah, a snake could be a God. Yeah, we'll write down that he's a snake. And, he, and yeah, he has feathers. And he breathes fire and he eats people. Yeah, that's what we'll make up and we'll scare the Jesus out of everybody. I don't think they made him up. I think that they saw him. I think those were manifested devils. And they saw him. They knew exactly what they looked like. They followed them. They knew what kind of God they were. They knew that they did eat humans, just like snakes eat animals. They knew that. So they developed their religion around things that they saw, heard, experienced, participated in. It's the way it's done. So now we've talked about uh, Tamuz, we've talked about Quetzalcoatl and all the related gods surrounding him. Now let's go to Egypt. Let's go to the place that God delivered his people out of. The place of Moses' nativity. He was born in Egypt, raised as an Egyptian prince, taught by the best Egyptian teachers, fed very well. And even though he was a Jew, he was raised as an Egyptian, given an Egyptian Moza, Moshe. Egyptian name means he was drawn out of the water. So, Last week, we found out that Quetzalcoatl came up out of the sea. So here we have Moses now in the land of Egypt, and God's going to bring his people out of Egypt because their religion is the religion of the Antichrist because it's based upon this guy who's carrying his, his version of the cross. Take a look at it. 
This is Osiris or Osiris, whichever you prefer. Notice the cross that he makes with his rod and his staff, his scepter. Uh, the disc on his forehead is an emblem of the sun because Osiris is, was the sun God. Now, if you were to, we'll just use Osiris as an example, but if you were to go throughout the world, how many religions in man's history worshiped literally the sun? The sun, they worshiped the moon, they worshiped the stars, these were their gods, but the sun was the principal god above all gods. And there's a reason why. The reason why is all of these are little Christs or fake Christ, or antichrist, because if there's one sun, then there's one sun. Makes sense, doesn't it? If there's one S-U-N, there's one S-O-N, the only begotten of the Father. And he is always likened to the sun in the scriptures. Notice Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son, notice the translators capitalize the S. They wanted you to know who that was. That was not just, it, they wanted to separate Jesus from the other sun gods that they knew about. Baal and all of these probably different sun gods throughout Canaanite history, Babylonian history, they all worship the sun. So the translators are separating this particular son out to show you that it represents Christ, the real son. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And I like this verse for several reasons, some of which I'll say now. He is the sun and shield. And I've mentioned this before, that it is known that because of the gravitational pull of the sun, it is what keeps the earth and the other planetary objects in their places, going around the sun, but there's other things up there. Meteorites, big comets, things like that, things that are large enough that if they smashed into the earth, oh boy, the damage it would cause. We have no, we know the location of a few craters here on earth. There's only a few because only a few throughout history, few meteors have actually impacted the earth. The reason why is, is that both the sun and the moon are shields to the earth. The moon having its own gravity can pull in large objects and they smash on the moon, whereas if there were no moon, we would not have that shield. The sun also pulling objects in. NASA tells us that they're, they're keeping track of, I don't know how many different meteors in the atmosphere or in, in space, atmosphere, in space and a lot of those are hurtling toward the sun. Why? Because of the sun's gravity and more than likely they'll miss the planet earth because the sun is taking them, think about it, he's taken the things that would be against us to himself. That sounds like a savior to me, amen? But the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And I, I might mention that later. John chapter 9 verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see that now? He's the sun. Revelation 1 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars. This is when John saw him and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So it is not sun worship that we practice. It's Christ worship 
who is the Son. When you think about on day four of creation, remember for the gospel, God specifically mentioned the Lord God created two lights, the greater light to rule over the day, the lesser light to rule over the night. Well, we have two, two covenants. One is greater than the other. Even though the Old Testament is larger than the New Testament, the New Testament is greater than the Old Testament. The New Testament, the sun shines in its strength and gives us light so we can understand who Jesus is, who God is, what our sin is, where we were headed, where, where can we go. It shows us the light of the glorious gospel. So it represents the greater light that rules over the children of the day, and we are the children of the day. But those who are ruled in darkness are ruled over by a lesser light, the law. They are ruled over by the law. You say, well, they don't keep the law. Exactly. They're still ruled over by it because the fact that they broke the law means that they are going to suffer the consequences that are brought by the law. So the best thing to do is to come out of darkness and come into the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See how that works? In John 17, when Jesus was transfigured, his face shone so bright they couldn't, they couldn't look at him. He was the sun. Moses acted that out when he came down from the earth, to, or came down from Mount Sinai the second time with the commandments in his hand. His face shone so bright like the sun that they could not look at him. They put a veil over his face. And Paul said that veil is the Old Testament. When they read it, they don't understand it. They can't see for what it is. All right? Then we have that mysterious angel in Revelation chapter 10, whose face shines as the sun. I just can't, I can't imagine how the identity of that angel could be anything other than Christ. I could be wrong, been wrong before, be wrong again. But anyway, let's move on. Osiris now then is going to be a copy of the idea of the sun god the ruler over all of the other, I mean, think about it. The stars, when you look up in the day sky, like I am now, I look out a window here, there's a big blue sky up there, but I don't see any stars. Are they there? Yeah. Why can't I see them? Because the light of the sun is actually brighter than the light of those stars. And once the sun comes out, his brightness shadows out or covers over the brightness of any of those stars so that you can't see them. He rules even over the stars. He rules them. He is the most high God. Osiris, the Savior, who is a, also another dying God who wants to be brought back to life again. While I'm thinking about it, let me show you this. This ferret died 33 years ago. Dun, dun, dun. Scientists just brought her back to life. So this is a beast that was and is not, yet is. 33 years later, his deadly wound was healed. Imagine that. That's actually going to play into what we're going to look at today. Now, I remember where I was when I... When this th thought came into my head, I was waiting on Sweetie Pie at Walmart. My feet were tired. My back was tired, hurting. So I said, I'm going to go sit down at the front and wait. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, well, I mean, the Holy Ghost just bang, pop, right inside my head with Isaiah 14. Now, I want you to read this now. now and as we read it, we've read it many times before, but as we read it, I want you to think of the sun. Lucifer is not the sun. If anything, he's the moon. He's a light bearer, and that's what the moon is. And the moon, basically, that, all that moon dust is just polished glass. That's all it is. Isn't that something? We wondered at the moon for thousands of years, why does it shine so bright? When we got there and collected the samples, brought it back and they analyzed it, and they said, well, it's little bitty, little bitty shards of glass and all that glass collectively together is transmitting reflecting the light of the Sun so the moon is a Lucifer but he doesn't want to be the moon 
He wants to be the sun when he grows up. Okay, so watch the procession now of Lucifer. And keep in mind, here I have this image of sunrise and sunset, and what I want you to think about it. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. The sun rises up off of the horizon, slowly ascends up to the sky. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So as the sun comes out, you can't see the stars anymore. And Lucifer was bright, wasn't he? I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, because not only does the sun rise east to west, it rises south to north. You catching this? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Why is it that early in the morning or late at sunset, the sun looks like it's lower than the clouds, which leads some people to believe the earth is flat, which it's not, unless you live in Kansas. But it leads some people to believe the earth is flat. Why is it that, that's, that it's that way? It's because the sun has reached a place where from our perspective, it is about to dip down below the horizon and we have the clouds up here and now the sun is below the clouds, or it looks that way. So he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And he liter the sun literally does that. Then he says, I will be like the Most High. The Most High is 12 noon. Let's say 12 noon, summer solstice, June 21st. You can't get, if you're the sun, you, don't, you can't get any higher than that. It's as high as it goes. And it is the most high it has been or ever will be. It's at 12 noon, June 21st. So it's in, in the highest part of the sky, straight up 90 degrees. And it's at the highest part of the tropics, the northern tropic, but does it stay there? No. So I've often said I will be like the most high and I always stop there, but there's more to it in this passage. The next verse says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So after high noon and after June 21st, summer solstice, what happens to the sun? Well, every day goes back down, dips below the horizon, and to us, to mankind, for thousands of years, that was going into the underworld, underneath the earth, or the nether parts of the earth, the heart of the earth. And then, it rises again. Same way, it goes to the northern tropic, then it can't go any farther north. It starts descending back down. The equator represents the earth. Then it goes down below the equator to the southern tropic, 23 degrees. 23 is the number for death, right? And that's something. And I, I would say this. I know this may not be popular, but practically anybody can be a Lucifer. Ah, yeah, I think there's more than one. I think a lot of lost men seek to be a Lucifer, to ascend above the heights, to be like God or to be godlike. Remember how the devil tempted Eve in Genesis 3. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll be exalted. You'll be lifted up. You'll be magnified. And everything that we hear talking right now, and it doesn't matter what part of the world you come from, it doesn't matter what area of life, whether you're a scientist, a critical thinker, whether you're a New Ager, whether you're in, into Hindu religions, 
you're into UFOs, doesn't matter. All of them are telling us that man is about to alter himself for the first time in man's evolution, quote unquote, that man now is going to create his own ascension up the evolutionary scale. He's going to change his own DNA. He's going to alter himself with technology and he's going to be homo novus, the new man. He's going to be, uh, what are some of the other names for it? Uh, but basically he's going to be a uh, homo deus, the man God. So every man that follows Lucifer is a Lucifer. They all seek to be like the most high, but they're not. All of them, including Lucifer himself, is going to be cast down, brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Every one of them. Notice this in Psalm 50, verse 1. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth. I love this. I was sitting thinking about, you know, what could go along with this. And I thought about the sun's motion and what it represents. You know, Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, not unto night showeth knowledge, and there's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Now, I often wondered about that verse, you know, the stars don't speak to me, I don't listen to them. And I've even read some things where now, Gemini is this, and Virgo is the Virgin Mary, and I don't do that. I don't do that for one big, gigantic reason. The Bible doesn't. Does not ascribe those 12 constellations up there with Virgo and Leo and Libra and Sagittarius, which is a man-beast. How you put that into Christianity, right? So the Bible doesn't do that. I'm not going to do that. We'll say, well, that's, they're preaching the gospel. Yeah, but not the way, not that way. Uh -uh, I don't believe that. So when God talks about this, in that same chapter, Psalm 19, he said, the son is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Who's the bridegroom? Christ, we know that. And he said, the heavens are the tabernacle for the son. So the bridegroom coming out of his chamber is the son, is the son of God, Jesus, the bridegroom, coming up out of the east. Notice the significance that God places on the sun rising in the east and going down in the west. This is why I think the devil tries to copy this and pervert it. When I read these verses, you'll get it. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Psalm 113, 3, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. So, what place on earth does the sun never rise and go down? There isn't a place. Even the North Pole and South Pole have seasonal sunshine. It'll last for a season, then they'll be plunged into darkness. Okay, but even they have a form of sunrise and sunset. Isaiah 45, 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. You get that now? God is saying, see that sun? How many suns are there? There's only one. And it rises in the east, goes down to the west, rises from the south to the north, back to the south again. And there isn't room for two sons. What did George Lucas create in the home world of Luke Skywalker? Two sons. Okay? So God is saying, just as Jesus is saying, he said, I am Christ, but there's going to be people come saying, I am Christ, and there's going to be many who will say that they are Christ, many false Christs, plural. So, just as we don't have more than one son, we don't have more than one savior. And no man can serve two masters. So if you find yourself following after multiple lights in the sky, are you in daylight or are you in darkness? Right? 
Well, I look at all the religions because I think all the religions are speaking of the same God. Oh, no, they're not. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. I think the standard could very well be the sun. He shall lift up a standard and the word of God, which they're the same. Because there's light here, there's light in the sun, light and heat. Malachi 1.11, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is none other than Jesus Christ. And I'm not ascribing salvation to the Vatican in any way, shape, or form. But isn't it true that the greatest name in religion in the Gentile world is Jesus Christ? Like I said, even though they worship Him wrongly, the greatest name among the Gentiles is Jesus Christ. Christ. Just as the sun, and there is nothing greater than the sun. Nothing. Rising in the east, going down in the west. Mark 16, 2. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. So what does the rising of the sun now represent to us? Jesus rising he was in the lower parts of the earth, and now, very early in the morning, at sunrise, he's risen from the dead. I've, we used to have sunrise services years ago, and I didn't see too many people raised from the dead, because by the time 7.30 rolled around, they were dead tired from having to get up at 4 to come to church. Yeah. So anyway, we just... Quit doing it. Who wants to get up? We don't have to, by the way. So you see it now. What the significance of the rising of the sun and going down of it is. It represents Christ. It represents the name Jesus Christ. It represents the fact that there is no other God. It represents the fact that nothing is stronger than the sun. Out of everything in this solar system, the sun has the greatest magnitude of it all. There's brightness in the solar system, but that nothing outshines the sun. There's gravitational force in the solar system, but there's nothing stronger than the force, the gravitational force of the sun. So the sun beats it all. Amen? So now you see the significance of it. Now you see why Lucifer wants to masquerade as that, wants to think himself that way, why he has all these false Christs set up everywhere. Now, just as Jesus was slain, was pierced, was stabbed for our salvation, so was the sun god, Osiris, stabbed and slain by a dog-faced pony soldier, or no, a pony dog Pony soldier face. I don't, anyway, I'm thinking Joe Biden stuff here. Anyway, he was stabbed by a dog-headed god by the name of Set. Now, we could say that Set in this story would represent evil Satan. Okay, that name kind of familiar. Set, possibly Satan, killed Osiris, cut his body up into 72 pieces. Now, this is... This is not gospel. This is not written down per se in scripture. This is the myth of Osiris. This is what they came up with. But why did they come up with this? Why so precise? Why mention the number 72 in this? Why is it that he's cut by his enemy? Why is it that his enemy fears that he'll rise from the dead? See, all of these ring true about the story of Jesus Christ. So it's not just some random myth that some guys said, let's dream up a religion and we'll make it this. And this idea 
was revealed to them or inspired to them, I believe by devils, the devil himself possibly, giving them this idea or this impression of a God that gets killed, cut up, so he can't be resurrected, but is resurrected anyway. And how is he resurrected? We'll see that in a little bit. But it took me a while for this one because I was wrong about something. Yeah, I had to admit it. Um, when I wrote the book uh, the, by divine order in the King James Code after that, I miscounted some things. I tried not to. I tried to be as accurate as I could, but I've found out since that some things I just didn't count right. In Genesis chapter 10, if you notice in verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So in Genesis 10, 10 for dominion, we have the first king, the first kingdom, Nimrod and Babel. And in these 32 verses, think about that number. In these 32 verses, you have the division of the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it lists us, the children, the grandchildren of each one. And in some cases on further down. So the first time I counted, I counted because I wanted there to be 70. I counted up 70. I got to send nature like everybody else does. Then somebody wrote me and said, Pastor, are you sure about that? Because I've counted Genesis 10 several times and I see 72 here. And I'm going, well, obviously they're wrong, <laughs> you know. So I decided one day to go back because I kept seeing the number 72. I've got notes in my Evernote. When I first started using Evernote, one night I was up late because my mind was running through this set number 72. And I was just looking at things on the internet that were numbered 72 things. I'm not going to get into that right now. But I was bothered by that, that number. I had not really seen that number in Scripture. What was it? What did it represent? One day, I had a pretty good one come to me. I looked up the word seal and all the forms of it. Seal with an asterisk in the Pure Bible Search software. Type that in 72 times. And I went, whoa. Because there was a story that I'd come across from alchemy about King Solomon that King Solomon took 72 evil devils and bound them up, put them in chains, put them in a box, and sealed them up. And I went, there's got to be a connection. There's got to be a connection. And there is. Think about things that are sealed. What are we sealed with? That Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? And does it just go to the 12 tribes of Israel? No. All the Gentiles plus all the Israelites can be sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. All of us in Christ, Jew or Gentile, are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, sealed by God until the day of redemption. Then we will be unsealed. Okay? We won't need the sealing anymore. We, we'll just have the new bodies and all that. So then I'm making that connection. And I go back to Genesis 10 and I recount properly. Laid them out on a spreadsheet, I think. Sure enough, there's 72 families in Genesis 10. 72. Now here's what happened. According to Egyptian myth, is that Set knew that Isis could probably um, put Osiris back together again, Humpty Dumpty. 
That's where it came from. According to Manley Hall, Osiris at his funeral had 72 pallbearers. What do pallbearers do? They bear the pall. They bear the corpse, the dead body. So why 72? Why did Osiris have 72 men that carried the pieces of his dead body? So then Set took the pieces, scattered them all over the world to make it absolutely impossible to put Humpty Dumpty Osiris back together again. Because there's, no, there's now no heir to the throne. Isis, his wife, had not bore a child yet, and Osiris is now dead, so there cannot be an heir to the kingdom. So the story is that Isis, and who is Isis? Because she's a female goddess, goddess of fertility, I might add. Who is she in the Bible? Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Her job is to go out and gather all the pieces and put them all back together again. Now, in Revelation 17, I don't have this in my notes. Let's just open our Bibles up, shall we? In Revelation 17, he starts out by saying in verse 1, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. What are those waters? Well, down here it says in verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Now, the four matters, but what four are they? Peoples, multitudes, nations. Nations, the Greek word here is ethnos which means their race, their family that they came from, and their tongues. What does that indicate to you? All of their different languages. Where does that stem from? Tower of Babel. So at the Tower of Babel, how many nations were there? One. How many types of people were there? How many languages did they speak? One. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, when you have a gathering together of the waters, what do you have? In Genesis 1, verse 9, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. And let the dry land appear, and it was so. The dry land. There was only one at that time. One dry land, gathering together the waters he called the sea. In verse um, 10, and God called the dry land earth. Sounds about right. And the gathering together of the waters. What are the waters? Peoples, multitudes, nations, tongues. The gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. Where does the beast rise from? Sea. So, think about it. 72 pieces and he scatters them all over the earth. So, you have everybody living together in Babel. They speak one language, all one people, and God takes them, and divides them by language first. So everybody pulls away from everybody else except the people they can hear speaking their language. Then lo and behold, they find their brother, their cousin, their aunts and their uncles, their relatives, because they figured out that each 
family, each tribe, got their own language. So they say, adios, goodbye, bon voyage, au revoir. And they all separate. So he divides the people into families, divides the nations and divides the tongues. And then in the days of Peleg, the earth divided. <laughs> now we really got them scattered. Because back then you could cross a lake, but you couldn't cross the Atlantic Ocean. You couldn't cross the Pacific. Nobody could. So now we have everybody, all 72 groups of people, spread all over the earth. Are you catching this? So, the idea of 72 pallbearers. That would be, and everybody on the planet right now, every human on the planet comes from those 72 nations. We're born from them. So, the Jews have this idea that, in fact, let me show it to you. See that tree of life there that called the Sephiroth, part of the Holy Kabbalah, the Kabbalah of Jewish mysticism. Jews all believe that when Ein Sof, who is their name for God, the unspeakable, unknowable God, the unknown God. In the Ein Sof, at the day of creation, there was a Big Bang. Yes, the Big Bang Theory came from Kabbalah. I'm convinced of it. Because this doctrine was around before the scientists came up with the Big Bang. That all of the universe was condensed into one point, one dot, and it was super dense, super hot, and then all of a sudden, boom, it exploded. And Ein Sof exploded with it. Ein Sof, think of the Ein, Ein Sof is the Antichrist. It's the creator God that the Jews don't know. They say we don't know who he is. So he blows up with the universe. So that scattered with the universe is a piece of Ein Sof. So, in Hinduism, Hinduism actually believes that everything in the universe is actually one thing. Not billions and trillions and quadrillions of individual things, but the whole universe. All the material, all the matter, all the living beings, everything, every rock, every thing of water, everything is one thing. And yet it exploded. And the idea is that if you can understand and fathom in your mind that you actually are part of the entire universe and the entire universe is part of you, then you've achieved this nirvana state, enlightenment. Edgar Mitchell, six man to walk on the moon, Apollo 14, on his way back, three day journey from the moon, has this samadhi experience where instantly, I don't know if he was meditating or what, but he's out in space and he said it changes you. He's out there and all of a sudden he has this experience. He has this enlightenment, this a shakti energy flowing through his body where he realizes that he and the universe are one thing. Are you catching what I'm pitching here? Because that's Osiris. Osiris is the Antichrist, the Ein Sof, the, the creator that the Jews don't know who he is. And they say that in each human there is a spark of the divine, a spark of God. And the idea is if we could bring everybody together, everybody together, wouldn't that be nice? All of us being liberal, socialist, communists, wouldn't that be great? If everybody on the planet would just go along with Joe Biden, wouldn't it be awesome? We could all just live happily ever after. Divisions, bad. Unity, good. So we want unity. We want everybody to come together 
and make sure you bring the pieces with you, all 72 of them. Because when all 72 pieces are put back together, then Os uh, Isis can bring Osiris back to life long enough to conceive a child with him. You hearing me? Guess who that child is? The son of perdition. That's who he is. Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. No good thing. Get out your pure Bible search software and type that in. Just type in the phrase, no good thing. It's only in the Bible twice. We already read Psalm. Guess where else it is? You'll get one of those. <gasps> Look at that. In Romans 7, Paul's talking about the difference between the out us and the in us. The outer man is ruled by the law. And it's wicked. It's awful. So Paul then teaches us the doctrine that, yes, because our flesh is still wicked and depraved, it's not capable of doing anything good. So man must be born again. He must have the inner man in him that, you know, cannot sin. But the outer man sins. It does. So, what did Paul say? For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now, that no good thing, the word dwell means abide, lives. There's something in us living there, like a cancer, like a virus, like a mole, like a tapeworm, just eating away at us. And everybody's got it. Everybody's got it. Everybody has no good thing dwelling in him. So what will God do? God will withhold no good thing from them that walk uprightly. I'll let you think about that for a while. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So I got a little, little piece of that Antichrist in me. It's bad. It's awful. It's terrible. My hope is, and my belief is, that when God destroys this flesh, He will destroy that wicked thing in me. Remember how I said earlier when Christ said, Behold, he is in the secret chambers, hidden, believe it not. That little thing is hidden in all of us. That man in us that we don't like for everybody to see, it's in there. No good thing living in us. One of these days, manifesting. Oh, that would be bad. He is the man of sin. And I like to think like the, the sum total of, where did God cast all of our sins, by the way? In the depths of the, yeah. Where does peace come from? I like to think he's like made up of all the sins of mankind. Rolled up into one big giant package. The most evil man to ever walk the earth. It's the Antichrist. And see, the Jews, that's their whole religion. Is that that divine spark is in everybody, but it needs to come out, needs to be birthed. There's a hidden man in there somewhere, needs to be brought out. So, 
in the, the Sephiroth, the image there that you see is these 22 paths, which are the 22 letters of Hebrew, the 22 letters of the DNA coding, 22 amino acids, which are the Hebrew letters that make the words that make the body. So the 22 members, 22 paths represent who? Humanity. Manly Hall said the circles, he called them divine circles. These are gods and scripture agrees. These are 10 kings, 10 kings, but not earthly kings, spiritual ones. Remember the uh, destroyer is the king of the bottomless pit, the angel of the bottomless pit. He's a spirit king. So man's been looking for 10 kings in history. I don't think they were in history. I think they're in the spirit. I think they're spirits. And lo and behold, these 10 are going to unite with the 22. Giving us what number? 32. And when they do, they'll have a king over them. It's that man with his arms stretched out like he's hanging from a cross. Remember Quetzalcoatl, Tammuz and his cross, Osiris holding his things crossed, Ben-Hadad the king of Syria gathered all his hosts together and there were 30 and two kings with him and horses and chariots because they're coming in these chariots that I've been talking about, aren't they? See, it makes sense. Now the word seal sort of makes sense now. Look up the word seal, sealed, sealist, sealing. Er, just type in seal, asterisk. 72 places, 72 occurrences in the King James Bible. And just read, and then read it again, and then read it again. And you'll start to see it. The mark of the beast seals all of these people. It guarantees that they are the body of the resurrected Antichrist. Well, Isis, oh look, look what Isis holds in her hand. It's a stylized cross. It's called the Ankh. Now why they put the H after, I have no idea. But it's called the Ankh. Manley Hall, Albert Pike, all the other Masonic authors and occult teachers, they all say the same thing about that Ankh. It's actually two symbols brought together. One symbol represents the male. The other symbol represents the female. I'll let you figure out which is which. But she finds all the pieces of Humpty Dumpty, Osiris, puts him back to except one. She can't find the part that will give her the baby. So she artificially makes one. Now, that concept now has ramifications in the world where we are manufacturing genetics, body parts, using technology and genetics together to make an artificial form of life, synthetic. See, for thousands of years they knew this story, they had no idea what it meant. But in today's world, I'm starting to get it. So she fashions the missing piece, and lo and behold, they have a baby boy named Horus. And Horus is represented by, first of all, the idols. You have Osiris and Isis and, oh, their baby boy, Horus, the God-man, 
Because I, I didn't tell you, Isis is an earth woman. Osiris is a god. So, they have a symbol that shows you what they are. Represents Horus and who he is. And it's called the Pythagorean Triangle. Named after Pythagoras. Because Pythagoras figured out a very simple yet profound formula for finding the length of a missing line out of a triangle. If you remember, Pythagoras' theorem was that if you take line A of the triangle and square it, let's say line A is two inches, so the square of two, two times two is four, and then take the square of line B of the triangle, let's say it's three inches, three times three is nine, so A squared is four, B squared is nine, and the theorem is, the theory is, the equation is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So, 4 plus 9 would be what? 13. I just made that up, but that's what it turns out to be. Then you unsquare the 13 to find out the length of line C. Simple math. So, you can see it's represented. The 47th problem was among the ancient Egyptians, the symbol of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. So, Os Osiris is line A, the god on the bottom that with the falcon head, because he's a deity, a god. And Isis represented by line B up at the top on the left. Well, when you add Osiris to Isis, you get Horus, who's a hybrid giant. And God hates them, doesn't he? By the way, this is the street layout of Washington, D.C. Notice anything? Where Washington's monument is, Washington's monument is an obelisk, bells or bales shaft. The artificial part of Osiris's body that Isis made herself. Isis is mankind, remember? So when you have Baal shaft and a line going from there to the White House, and then a line going from there, a straight line going right to the front door of the Capitol building. When the president is inaugurated, with the exception of the 46th president, the 46th president, they did it differently. And they've done it differently with other presidents. But the 46th president, they did differently. He was inaugurated someplace else and didn't walk. That's Pennsylvania Avenue that goes from the Capitol building up to the White House. He didn't walk it this year. Now, it could be nothing. By the way, Joe Biden is 46th different president of the United States. Okay? Do you remember how long the Washington Monument is? It's exactly 555 feet. Exactly. And if you read um, the lost symbol, you'll remember that it has a winding staircase, like DNA, like what's in the house of the Lodge Temple, winding staircase, and when I counted them, 23 steps on one side, 23 steps on the other, and this was built in the 30s. So how did they know the 46 chromosomes going into the main temple area? How did they know that? So the winding staircase going up to the pinnacle, the top, 
But what's underneath the Washington's Monument? You know what's under there? Of course, there's going to be like a, um, a cornerstone of a building or a foundation stone. And underneath it is just a box with one thing buried in it. The King James Bible, hidden, buried, down in the heart of the earth awaiting ascension up the ladder, the spiral ladder staircase to become God, having climbed 555 feet. You know whose name is in this King James Bible exactly 555 times? Christ. Do you know what other word? All the forms of the word righteous. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Romans 5.17 For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Romans 8.10 And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And the man of sin is no good thing. He cannot give you righteousness. All he can give you is more sin. Only Christ can give you righteousness. So when we are adorned in Revelation 19, the bride, when the robes are given to us of fine linen, white and clean, what are those robes? What do they represent? For the fine linen, white and clean, are the righteousness of the saints. King James is the only Bible that says it that way. All the other modern translations say the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints, which then put you in the category of Freemasonry. Because Freemasonry, those guys wear that lambskin apron, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They wear that lambskin apron because they believe they stand before God. God sees the lambskin and he says, oh, you've done righteous deeds. You've done good deeds on the earth. You've done the work of a mason. Therefore, you can come into this big house that I built. You can come into that. That's what it, rep it represents, work salvation. So that Washington's monument, who are they pretending to be with Baal's shaft, 555 feet tall? The Bible down in the basement another Jesus, isn't it? And if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. We'll finish this up next week with a couple more dying gods that are awaiting resurrection. Okay? Then we'll move on to some of the present Christ's including some in some movies that you've seen, all right? And I appreciate your help on that. I asked our group on Facebook, help me out with people in the Bible or people in movies that died and were brought back to life. E.T., Neo from The Matrix, among others. They're all symbols of Christ placed there by Hollyweird, all right? This is Pastor Mike. You're the reason why I do what I do. I love you very much. Thank you for your love for the people of Kenya. Continue to pray for them and our ministry and our work around the world. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.